Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 12th of February. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast coming to you from Arirang's news centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. For the first time in seven years, the two Koreas are getting ready to hold a high-level meeting at the Truce village of Panmunjom. The Pyongyang proposed talks come ahead of this month's inter-Korean family reunions and Seoul's military drills with Washington. Korean female speed skater Lee Sang-hwa grabs Team Korea's first Olympic gold medal in Sochi at the women's 500-meter event. He also smashed the Olympic record with a time of 74.70 seconds. Plus, the new head of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, says the central bank will continue reducing its bond-buying stimulus measures amid steady economic improvements. The two Koreas are holding high-level talks at the truce village of Panmunjom on this Wednesday morning. The meeting, the first between the North and the South in several years, comes a matter of days ahead of a round of reunions for families separated since the Korean War. For more details, we are going to connect live to our correspondent Hwang Sang-hee at the Unification Ministry. Sang-hee, what's the latest? Good morning, Mark. The meeting was scheduled to take place at around 10 a.m. Korea time, which is about now, so it should be getting underway as we speak. The South Korean delegation left for the truce village of Panmunjom, uh, which is where the meeting is being held at around 7.30 this morning. Uh, Kim gyu hyun the South Korean chief delegate, told reporters that he would pour all his efforts into holding fruitful discussions. I will engage in the talks with an open attitude to study an opportunity to bring in a new era on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's five-member delegation is composed of officials from the presidential office of Chawade, the Unification Ministry, and the Defense Ministry. The North Korean delegation is led by Won dong yeon deputy head of the United Front Department of the Ruling Workers' Party of Korea, with officials from the National Defense Commission, the military, and the Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea. The meeting was proposed by North Korea last, uh, last Saturday, that is, and the two sides will be discussing pressing inter-Korean issues. So, Sungi, we hear the two Koreas have not set a specific agenda on what will be discussed at the talks. What topics are expected to be brought up today? Mark, that's right. It is rare for the two Koreas to meet for talks without setting a fixed agenda on what will be discussed. South Korea's chief delegate told reporters this morning that South Korea will focus on ensuring that the family reunions take place as planned. As you know, the two Koreas are scheduled to resume the reunions from February 20th to the 25th, and if held, it'll be the first such event in more than three years. However, the reunion event uh, won't be North Korea's top priority at today's meeting. Experts say Pyongyang will be seeking to stop the upcoming joint military exercises between Seoul and Washington, which is scheduled to begin at the end of this month. South Korea and the U.S. say the drills are defensive in nature, but the North views them as a practice for war and has repeatedly called for the exercises to be canceled. North Korea had earlier threatened to reconsider its agreement to hold the family reunions should the joint military exercises take place as planned. Mark? Well, thank you very much, Sungi, and please do keep us updated throughout the day. That was our Unification Ministry correspondent, Hwang Sungi, with the latest on the first high level talks between the two Koreas in seven years. Now, as Sungi just mentioned, reunions of families separated since the Korean War are set to be held next week for the first time in years. But the threat of yet another cancellation hangs over the event. North Korea says it may be forced to call off the reunions because of Seoul's plans to hold its annual joint military drills with Washington. Our Connie Lee has more on why Pyongyang is so dead set against the exercises. The verbal threats from North Korea are unrelenting. Stop the military drills or face Holocaust. Continue with the drills and prepare for nuclear war. Go ahead with the drills and see the reunions of separated families cancelled next week. But can we really expect Kim Jong-un to call off the reunions once again? They would not at uh, this time. That's my understanding. Because this year is a little bit different because they've been uh, pressured by even China and all the neighboring countries. On top of that, North Korea desperately needs uh, cash. 
Kim Chol-ru of the Korea Institute for Defense Analyses says the recent threats are part of a propaganda game Pyongyang launches each and every start of the new year to unify the people of the communist state. It's kind of a rhetorical propaganda to point out the very offensive nature of this uh, exercise, but it's not the, the case. This exercise is very uh, defensive oriented. The key resolve and full eagle drills, set to start on February 24th and run until April 18th, are among the largest military exercises in scale in South Korea. Conducted annually by the South Korean military alongside the U.S. Armed Forces, they include 200,000 Korean troops and more than 12,000 U.S. troops. The joint drills, which include computer-based exercises and a set of ground, air and naval operations, test the capabilities of the South Korean and U.S. militaries in the event of an all-out war. These are not unfamiliar practices or drills to the Korean Peninsula, but Pyongyang often takes the opportunity to escalate tensions between the two Koreas and justify their nuclear and weapons programs. I think the North Korean's propagandist maneuver to legitimize their way of actions uh, is a very critical point. Republic of Korea and United States forces here in Korea have studied and prepared decisively for the last 20 years. Uh, so I think we don't have to worry about the security situation in here in South Korea. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, seeing more than a meter's worth of snow piled up on streets, cars and buildings is not an unusual sight these days in the country's eastern region of Kangwon-do. Proper clean-up efforts couldn't even begin because of the relentless snow over the past six days. But with the snow expected to subside on Wednesday, the clearing process will begin. In the Yongdon region of Kangwon-do, some 2,000 pieces of snow-removing equipment and 40,000 clean-up workers will be dispatched to get things running smoothly again. The financial impact of this heavy snow has been staggering. Estimates put the damage at 10 trillion won, or roughly 9.3 billion U.S. dollars. More bad news may be on the way as well, as forecasters are warning the region will be hit with another, possibly even heavier snowstorm on Thursday and Friday. A former leading Korean scientist has received a U.S. patent on a controversial stem cell line that sparked a huge scandal nearly a decade ago. Hwang Woo Sok was earlier convicted of falsifying papers and embezzling government funds, but this latest development may open the door for his return. Paulie reports. Disgraced cloning scientist Hwang Woo Sok is again making waves in the international scientific community with a recent U.S. patent based on his controversial stem cell research. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office confirmed this past week that the NT1 embryonic stem cell line had been granted legal protection along with its respective laboratory process. Huang was among the 15 inventors listed on the approved patent. The NT1 line is based on creating human embryonic stem cells by transferring the core genetic information of a normal human somatic cell into a female egg. First announced in 2004, the scientific breakthrough made headlines worldwide for being the first ever line of stem cells extracted from cloned human embryos. The pioneering experiments propelled Korea to the forefront of cloning research, with Dr. Huang and his team publishing landmark papers in the world's most prestigious scientific journals. But the fame was short-lived, as investigations discovered that Huang had fabricated much of his research results. As a result, he was stripped of his position from Seoul National University and later convicted of embezzling research funds and violating bioethics laws. However, the recent U.S. patent development may mark a turning point. Experts say the NT1 patent does not mean the stem cell production process has been proven scientifically, despite claims by Huang and his supporters. Instead, he may use the patent to ask Korean authorities to lift a ban on certain research, which he was barred from continuing more than seven years ago. A veterinarian by training, Huang now leads the Suan Biotech Research Foundation in Gyeonggi-do province, focusing on bioengineering work with animals. Though Huang's fall from grace tainted Korea's scientific reputation, some say the scandal raised public and government awareness of stem cell research. Korea currently has more stem cell treatments than any other country in the world. Paul Yi, Arirang News.
U.S. Federal Reserve Chief Janet Yellen has vowed to support the approach to stimulus tapering that her predecessor, Ben Bernanke, started to pursue before he stepped down last month. Making her first public comment since taking the helm, Yellen sounded optimistic about the prospects for the U.S. economy. Jimmy Gill reports. In her first public appearance as Federal Reserve Board Chair on Tuesday, Janet Yellen told Congress that while the labor market recovery still has a way to go despite a drop in unemployment, the Fed will continue to reduce the support it's providing the U.S. economy through monthly bond purchases. The recovery in the labor market is far from complete. Purchases are not on a preset course and the committee's decisions about their pace will remain contingent on its outlook for the labor market and inflation, as well as its assessment of the likely efficacy and costs of such purchases. Analysts say Yellen's testimony signals a continuation of the policy started under her predecessor, Ben Bernanke. Under Bernanke, the Fed bought trillions of dollars worth of bonds to drive long-term borrowing costs lower. In December of last year, it started to scale back its stimulus program. The new Fed chief also noted the recent turbulence in the world's financial markets. We have been watching closely the recent volatility in global financial markets. Our sense is that at, the, at this stage, these developments do not pose a substantial risk to the U.S. economic outlook. Yellen also ensured investors by saying interest rates would remain very low. U.S. markets reacted positively to her comments, with all three main share indexes closing over 1 percent higher after her remarks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up almost 200 points as investors welcomed Yellen's steady tone. Kim young Arirang News. French President Francois Hollande received a warm welcome at the White House on Tuesday, where he's on his first full state visit to the United States by a French leader in nearly two decades. Speaking to reporters after talks with U.S. President Barack Obama and ahead of a black tie state dinner, Hollande said the two countries had restored their trust in one another after revelations of widespread U.S. snooping. The two leaders also discussed the conflict in Syria and he Iran's disputed nuclear program. On Wednesday, Alond will travel to San Francisco and meet the CEOs of Silicon Valley giants, including Facebook, Twitter, and Google. The trip comes as a welcome break for Alond, as the French leader is mired in desperately low approval ratings at home and a love triangle gone bad. First Talks aimed at finding a peaceful solution to the Syrian conflict are proving extremely frustrating, with the Syrian government and the opposition reporting little progress. At a second day of talks in Geneva, the UN diplomat charged with running the talks, Lakhtar Brahimi, says that for things to take off, cooperation from both sides and a lot of external support was needed. Brahimi added that he will hold talks with senior Russian and U.S. officials on Friday. The talks come amid chaotic scenes in the besieged Syrian city of Homs, where the U.N. is attempting to coordinate the evacuation of civilians during a temporary ceasefire. During the attempted evacuation, Syrian authorities detained over 330 men and are still thought to be questioning most of them without direct supervision from any neutral third party. A military transport plane has crashed in bad weather in northeastern Algeria, killing 77 people and leaving just one survivor. Algeria's defense ministry says air traffic controllers lost radio, radio and radar contact with the U.S.-built C-130 Hercules plane just before noon on Tuesday afternoon local time and dispatched helicopters to try and find it. The plane was discovered in pieces on a mountain near a town some 50 kilometers southeast of Constantine, the main city in eastern Algeria. Officials say poor weather conditions and storms accompanied by snow in the region caused the crash. An official told the Associated Press that the lone survivor, a soldier, suffered head injuries and was treated at a nearby military facility before being flown to the military hospital in Algiers. Now, one of Korea's most respected cinema directors, Park Chan-wook, has co-directed a movie about Seoul, along with his brother, 
The film was made possible thanks to thousands of people sending in their own video clips. Our cultural correspondent Park Ji Won reports. The first ever crowdsourcing film on Seoul has just been released online. Thousands of people from all over the world submitted more than 11,000 video clips about Seoul and Cannes-winning Korean film director Park chan Uk and his famed media artist brother Park chan Kyung made them into a movie titled Bitter Sweet Soul. The film used 154 of the clips that were sent in. Rather than focus on the capital city's landmarks, Park chan Uk said he wanted to focus on the more historic and complex aspects of the city along with the vibrant lives of the people that call it home. As the title of the film suggests, bitter and sweet things happen in our lives at the same time. Just as the memories of war remain, Korea has achieved some level of democratic and economic success. I wanted to say that bitterness and sweetness can coexist in our lives. I think the song that appears last in the film, the traditional Korean song Shim Chung Ga, represents the film's hopeful message. Everyone benefits from Shim Chung's sacrifices and she recovers as well. That's the message of hope to anyone who is in the midst of hardship. 41 participants were rewarded for providing their video footage. They expressed joy for having contributed to the film. I must say I was very surprised because one of my videos is showing something not very nice about Seoul. So I, I sub, when I sent it, I thought this one cannot win. It proved that they, they were willing to choose something that is not especially pretty, but very interesting about the city, that it's always changing. We thought it would be a great idea. She was pregnant at the time, very pregnant. And so we started f taking some video, and we said, maybe let's, let's try to do this. Made in Seoul is one of the topics. He's made in Seoul. So it took off from there. The project was commissioned by the city of Seoul. Most promotional videos just show landmarks of the city, but they don't touch the hearts of viewers. I hope to show how citizens and visitors truly experience a city and let them speak about their individual experiences. The hour-long film can be checked out online at youtube.com slash movie. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Worth checking out there. Now, with the Sochi Winter Olympics in full swing, go big or go home isn't just the mantra of the athletes anymore. Korean companies are also looking to rake in their own form of gold from the international sporting event. Connie Kim reports. Russia poured a record 51 billion U.S. dollars into the 2014 Winter Olympic Games. But Russia is hardly alone in investing a fortune in Sochi, as many companies are seeking to promote their brands through one of the world's most watched sporting events. All athletes who participated in the opening ceremony last Friday received complimentary Galaxy Note 3s by Samsung Electronics, one of the 10 official sponsors of the Sochi Games. An official sponsorship comes with a price tag of $100 million, but also ensures that the company's brand logo is viewed by the 1 billion Olympic viewers. Through sports marketing, a company's brand recognition goes up along with their brand value, which leads to an increase in sales in the long term. As a matter of fact, Samsung Electronics' market share in China nearly doubled after the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Companies who are not official sponsors of the Games are supporting certain athletes and teams in other ways. KB Financial Group has been sponsoring Vancouver gold medalist Kim Yana since 2006 and also backs long track speed skater Lee sang and short track speed skater Shim seok ki Sponsoring the Korea Skating Union started out more like corporate social responsibility to raise awareness of unpopular winter sports. Thanks to the outstanding performances of the athletes, our company logo has gained exposure in the media and improved the company's brand image overall. Back here in Korea, retailers like this are seeking to take advantage of the Olympics by offering special discounts on popular products such as beer and snack foods. One fried chicken franchise is also offering special discount offers whenever a Korean athlete wins a medal. It goes to show that it's not just companies with global recognition that are reaping the benefits of the Winter Games, but also businesses within the country. Connie Kim, Arirang News.
And a golden Wednesday to you all as the nation stayed up till late hours to watch South Korean speed skater Lee Sang Hwa compete for the 500 meter women's speed skating event. And it was all worth it in the end. Now, with the pressure on her to win Korea's first medal in Sochi, she finishes the first race with the final time of 37.42 seconds, good for first place after the first race. But in the final race, the Vancouver gold medalist turns on her gears and sets a new Olympic record with the final time of 37.28 seconds, winning her second straight Olympic gold with a combined time of 1 minute 14.70 seconds, which is another Olympic record. It's Korea's first medal in Sochi as she becomes the first Asian to win two straight gold medals in the event. Now that Lee sang is her second straight 500-meter speed skating gold, what's next for her? Well, the 1,000-meter speed skating event set to take place on Thursday. While she might be a world-class speed skater in the 500-meter event, she doesn't fare too well during the 1,000-meter event. And while she's not considered one of the favorites to win a medal, fans here in the nation know anything can happen during the Olympics. And moving over to women's curling, where the South Korean women's curling team went into their first Olympic competition earlier on Tuesday. Now, first off on the round robin session two, the 10th ranked Korea women's team looked amazing in their Olympic debut as they beat 9th ranked Japan with a final score of 12 to 7. But later on the day, facing off against the 4th ranked Switzerland, despite a hard fought match, they fell just short as they lost 8 to 6 despite a late rally in the 9th end. We're now coming into day five of the Sochi Winter Games, and with Korea hoping for another great day, let's take a look at a couple of events to look forward to. Now, first off, the Korea women's curling team go into their round robin session four as they're set to face off with world number one Sweden later in the day. But the biggest event to look forward to will be the men's 1,000 meter speed skating event as Lee Gyu Hyuk, Kim Tae Yoon, and Mo Tae Bum go into the event hoping for Korea's second medal. While Motebon fell short in the 500-meter event, it'll be a chance to redeem himself as he hopes to duplicate his performance from the 2010 Vancouver Games when he finished with a silver medal. All right, let's finish things off by taking a look at the medal count after four days of competition in Sochi. Of course, taking a look at the chart here, looks like Norway is back up on top as they now have four gold medals, three silver and four bronze for a total of 11 medals. Canada drops to second with a total of now met nine medals, with U.S. remaining in top five with two gold, one silver, and four bronze. Meanwhile, Korea breaks the top ten ranking, adding their first gold medal thanks to Lee sang -hwa. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. And time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world. And that's all for now. Thanks ever so much for joining us. We'll be back at noon Korea time. But in the meantime, you can always catch up with what's been happening on our website, arirang.co.kr forward slash news.